So this morning, we are getting started in Revelation. How many are excited to study Revelation? I, I, I love Revelation. Here's the thing. It is the start of a new series, and, and to be truthful, it is one that is both extremely exciting, but pretty daunting, if you know what I mean. Revelation is one of the most complex books in the Bible. It's one of the most complex books. Its language is both literal and figurative. So when we look at the language of the Bible, its descriptions are intense, and its narrative can be upsetting. When we think about what's going to happen in this world, on this planet, it's filled with warning and alarm. Its images are disturbing and can be scary at times. But listen, how many know ultimately our hope lies in Jesus Christ? Amen? Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, right? I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, that solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen? Listen, how many know? Let's pray. Is that a good idea? Let's pray before we get started. Man, Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to start this series, to share your word. Lord, I pray that as we go throughout this series, as as we start just the foundations of the series today, Lord, that it would not be instill, uh, that there, there would not be any fear, but there would be hope. That in the middle of chaos, there wouldn't be any worry, but there would be trust. There would be faith. Lord, I thank you for what you have revealed to us in your word, the clues that you've given us, the signs that we're to look to. Lord, I pray that we would be aware. Lord, I pray that we would approach this series with faith and with wisdom. Lord, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth are not mine, but yours. Not my thoughts, but yours. I thank you for working in and through me to deliver these messages. Thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. There is coming a day when all may seem hopeless. But you should know it only seems that way, right? There's coming a day when it seems like everything is thrown into chaos. And some people would say, that's today. That's, that's, that's now. Listen, but it only seems that way. That's what we have to be aware in our Christian faith. No matter what is on CNN and what's on Fox News and, and what's going on in Portland or Seattle or all the other cities in America where they're burning right now, listen, where there is chaos and where there is heartache and where there is struggle, and it seems like all hope is lost, it only seems that way because our hope does not lie in government. Our hope does not lie in who the president is. Listen to this carefully. Our hope does not lie based on what's what's in the news. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen? As Christians, sometimes we have to come back to that. This is where our hope lies. Yes, we have certain hopes for different outcomes in the world, and and we know that we we want things to maybe get better and, and do better in these different ways, but we can't get caught up in losing out on what God has for us and the vision that God gives us because we're caught up in these other things. How many know we can get wrapped up in the things that are going on right now? We can get wrapped up in politics. We can get wrapped up in the media. We can get wrapped up in entertainment. We can get wrapped up in so many different things that we lose focus and lose vision of what God wants to do in our life. No matter what state our culture may be in, our hope is built on nothing less, right, than Jesus' blood and righteousness. This series is interesting because... It's going to consist of some preaching, but mostly teaching. Uh, Let me just say clearly that this teaching is not just what God has spoken to me. Okay, it's not just, all right, Lord, I'm reading Revelation, whatever you give me. 
listen, there I've uh, used multiple teachers, theologians, pastors, commentaries, experts. I do what I can to study it diligently, to preach it to you and teach it to you in a correct way. But listen, truly, there are pictures and concepts within Revelation that make my head hurt. How many know what I'm talking about? All right, if you've read Revelation, you know exactly what, they make your head hurt. However, I will say this, I will do my very best to explain these things so that there is no confusion. Okay, so we're going to dive into word studies. We're going to dive into spiritual concepts and theories that at times, just to be honest, may be controversial. Uh, at times you may go, oh, I've never heard this before, or are you sure that's how it's going to be? Or We're going to get into some in interesting things there. So this is a study that is going to challenge you and what you believe about what we would call the end times. Revelation, a study of the end of days. Uh, some of you were raised in church. How many people were raised in church and you know Revelation, right? You, you raised in church, you kind of know Revelation, you know a bit about it, right? So maybe even at this church, you were taught Revelation. And some of you don't know anything about Revelation. That's okay. If that's where you're at, that's okay, okay? My goal is not to overwhelm or confuse anybody. Amen? Nobody wants to be confused but to help us all understand some really incredible concepts found in Scripture and then some really deep truth. So we're going to get into some interesting stuff. With that in mind, I'm going to do something I have not done ever in the five-plus years that I've been here, and it's this. As we're going through this last book of the Bible together, there may be questions that come up in your mind. You go, man, I got questions about this and questions about end days and revelation. What does this mean? What does that mean? And so if you have a question that comes up that you're curious about, maybe you want to clear up some confusion, you go, I just, I just want to know more. Here's what we're going to do. Go to the next slide there, Austin. Uh, I am putting out my email address and my phone number so that if there is any questions that come up during this series, you can ask them. And then at the end of the series, what I'm going to do is probably a session just on questions and answers. Where we go, man, okay, you got questions about this? Let's answer this. Now, I'll be the first one to say, it's going to be a while before we get to the end of the series. It's 22 chapters. This morning, uh, <laughs> this morning we're going to start in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to forewarn you, we only get through the first three verses. Bobby Hansen is like, oh my, this is going to take a while. I promise you some things are going to go quicker than others. But listen, you, you can't just look at Revelation and study Revelation. You have to look at Thessalonians. You have to look at Daniel. You have to look at Matthew. You have to look at a lot of other books of the Bible that have to do with prophecy and the end of times or the end of days. And so as we go through the 22 chapters of Revelation and a lot more, a lot of questions are going to come up, and a lot of questions may be about what's happening today in the world, and how does that relate to what may happen later? Kind of cool stuff, huh? Some people are excited, and some people are like, I don't know. <laughs> Carrie is over there like, I love Carrie. <laughs> She's just smiling like sunshine. That's good. Well, Carrie's sunshine. That's good. Amen. Let's start this morning at the beginning of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, started going through verse 3, and it says this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Say the time is near. We are going to begin by first looking at what the book of Revelation contains. So this is the groundwork upon which we will build 
the rest of our study. We have to begin with foundation, right? Say foundation. How many know you can't build a house unless you have a foundation? At least not a very strong house. <laughs> you know, uh, how many ever built like a little tree house when you were a kid? I did. I built it. Well, we tried, you know, uh, failed multiple times. There's no foundation. It always ended up getting blown over by the wind or something happened. We had sticks, sticks tied with twine, and we would try to make a little wall and try, right? It blows over. A house without a foundation is not strong, right? So we got to have a good foundation, and that's what we're going to get into. Much of what we go over today is just foundation for the rest. So the foundation of this book starts off in the first three verses, which are incredibly important. First is this. Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That should be number one. Amen? It's a revelation of Jesus Christ given to show the servants of God what things must take place soon. What's going to take place soon? So it's given by an angel to the Apostle John, also known as St. John, who is also called John the Revelator. I like that name. It sounds like the Terminator, but it's just not. It's John the Revelator. He is also, of course, the author of the Gospel of John. And he's one who walked alongside Jesus and did so faithfully. Amen? If you ever read the book of John, uh, in the book of John, John writes that he was Jesus' favorite disciple a lot of times. And he's like, John is my beloved. And he looked at his favorite disciple and said, take care of my mother and things like that. John kind of puts himself out there as Jesus' closest friend, right? So here we have an introduction. John the Revelator is being given a revelation of Jesus Christ and writing it for us. So the, we're going to get into the first four chapters of Revelation have to do with what was happening then. And then afterwards, we get into the different visions that start happening with John. And that's where it gets really, really interesting. But uh, before we get into that, let's look at this verse. Because we have the introduction, then we have the blessing in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. What is prophecy? This is not referring to just uh, something to edify the body, but this is referring to future events. This is referring to uh, something that we cannot know unless God reveals it to us. Amen? So there's times where somebody may say they have a prophetic word or sometimes where somebody has a prophecy. It is a forecast. It is a telling of the future. The angel is speaking to John, and John is given visions of the future. The future that he sees is what we refer to as the end of days or the end times. Now, I want to pause here for a bit and dive into some of the concepts surrounding this book, the views surrounding this book. How many ever studied the end times? I have, if you've studied the end times, it's, it's what's known as eschatology. So eschatology is the study of the end times. And in fact, the word revelation, go to the next slide. The word revelation is equal to the Greek, Greek word apocalypsis. Say apocalypsis. It's kind of a cool word. Uh, apocalypsis is where we get the word apocalypse. All right? It's a word that literally means to uncover or to reveal. So when we talk about revelation, it's uncovering God's plan. It's revealing to us what God has in store. Amen? It's pretty cool stuff. Uncover, reveal. How many know the word apocalypse can be kind of a scary word? <laughs> I said, how many know the word apocalypse? And Caleb raised his hand because he knows the word. Good job. Uh, that's a good. Yeah, that's good. How, what grade are you in, Caleb? Sixth grade, man. Apocalypse. That's awesome. How many know apocalypse can be scary? How many ever, you think about apocalypse, you think about, how many, how many ever seen movies? 2012, right? How many ever seen 2012? It's a horrible movie. Uh, it's, it's horrible acting. Great special effects. Everybody dies. Uh, really uplifting family film. Uh, no, I'm just, it's, that's sarcasm for those who are watching online. Uh, no, uh, uh, the, we think of these disaster films. 
that depict the apocalypse, the end of days, the destruction of everything. And so when you think of apocalypse, that can be a scary word. It can, it can incite fear. It can incite paranoia. It can cause anxiety and nervousness, right? Because most people relate apocalypse to disaster or catastrophe. But the truth is, as we go through Revelation, listen to this, some of it is incredibly graphic and gruesome. Some of it gets into some really hardcore type things. Revelation is not a relaxing picture of rainbows and sunshine. How many enjoyed the storm last night? I did. I enjoy storms. I find them relaxing. Uh, sometimes if you're running through it, not so relaxing. But I got home and I was enjoying the storm. It was, it was just, it's relaxing to me. Revelation is not relaxing. It's not a relaxing picture. It's a picture of judgment. It's a picture of war. But how many know that in the end, it is a picture of the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's what Revelation is about. It's what is leading up to the return and what happens during it. So the second thing I want to establish through this study is this. We're going to have, naturally have questions about when is this going to take place? When is this going to happen? How many know that's a natural question? We see this. We go, man, okay, when is this going to happen? And the answer to it is found in chapter 1 and verse 1 and verse 3. When will they take place? It says this. Go back one slide. It says this. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, for the time is near. Say near. The time is near. Sometimes we see it says uh, will happen soon. Uh, the first verse says that soon must take place. How many know the words soon and near are relative terms, right? Well, when are you going to get there? Soon. Well, how long is soon? I'm near. How near are you? I'll be there soon. We would have, we, uh, I'm not going to go into names or anything. We would, some, we would have people over and we'd say, and we'd call them say, when are you going to be here? Soon. Oh, okay. So are you near? We'll be there soon. And it was like half an hour later. How, how many, when I think of soon, I think of oh, two, three, four minutes, five minutes maybe, right? They said soon. I said, oh, okay. Half an hour later, food's cold. They said soon. I'm near. How, how close is near? Well, it depends, on, it depends on, on, on how far you're traveling, right? So if I'm traveling from New York to Los Angeles, if I get to Iowa, I'm near. I'm nearer than where I was, right? Right, but if I'm going from Iowa to Los Angeles and I'm in Spirit Lake, I'm nearer, but I'm not near. Get to Colorado, near. Las Vegas, near. Soon and near are relative terms. So what may be soon and near in our vernacular and our understanding and concept of time might not be God's understanding and concept of time. So when we talk about soon and near, we believe that these things are going to take place. And some of the things that we talked about going into chapter 4 have already taken place. So there are things that have taken place and things that will take place. And we don't want to confuse the two. Soon and near. It's interesting. It's been 2,000 years since this was written. And we are still moving towards seeing Revelation come to pass. So what does soon really mean, right? So the word soon is actually a Greek word. It's tache, T-A-C-H-E-I, tache. Some people, some people may say take, tiche, tache is how I pronounce it. It means this, that when it happens, when all this happens, it's going to happen suddenly. When it happens, it's going to happen quickly. It's going to happen suddenly. But, but Pastor David, when? When is it going to happen? I want to know when. Do you want to know when? I'll tell you when. Soon. <laughs> Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. How many have ever seen this? Repent. 
for the end is near. Gary, how many, have you ever see this sign? Gary, did you ever hold one of these signs? Did you ever hold one of these signs? No. I, th it's interesting because back in the 80s and 90s, that was like a big thing. If you go to a, if you go to a thing where you're uh, ministering to people in the, at the fair or on the sidewalk, or something, there's always somebody standing around, John 3.16 on one side, right? And the end is near repent on the other. John 3.16, great verse, great for evangelism. Repent, the end is near. Maybe other people aren't as uh, responsive to that type of rhetoric, right? So the end is near. Well, what does near mean? We don't know. From the early church until now, there have always been those who claim to know when. There's always been those who claim to know when the end will take place. Some have even claimed the exact day or the exact year. Now, it's probably no surprise that uh, many cult leaders have done this. Charles Taze Russell was one that did this. The Jehovah's Witnesses have done this. The Mormon Church has done this. Uh, cults, of course, that have gotten into really strange things. But it might surprise you that there's some well-known Christian leaders who have tried to give some sort of prediction as to when Christ will return. Well-known Christian leaders that just, hey, they, they thought, yep, this is going to be the time. I still remember. How many remember Y2K? How many remember the predictions of Y2K? Everything's going to shut down. The electricity is going to go off everywhere. Your cars aren't going to work anymore. You better have gasoline stored up. You better have toilet paper. Nowadays, you really better have toilet paper. Right? You better have all these things because it's the end of days. I remember I was at my grand, my grandmother had brought a, a videotape over for my if kids don't know what a videotape is. Uh, look at your parents and have them explain it to you. Uh, my grandma had a, brought a videotape over and it was a guy who was preaching and saying, Y2K is it. That's, this, is, this is when Jesus is going to return. And inevitably, the date passes. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, well, you know, maybe he did return, but you didn't see it. There's people that do that. It was an invisible return. Exactly, Mason. Mason, how old are you? Eight years old, already knows it's junk, right? He says, that's junk, that's, that's ridiculous. Oh, maybe you can, it's just invisible. The Bible tells us in more scriptures than we can go over, even, I mean, today, about some of the signs of the end times. We can't know exactly when, but we can understand the signs of the end times. And to see that, we're going to step away from Revelation for a minute. And you'll, so we're going to go into what Jesus said in Matthew 24. This is part of what we call the Olivet Discourse. Uh, Mike, Doreen, if you guys have been to Israel, you were on the Mount of Olives. Uh, that's where I was. This is where Jesus started teaching this discourse on the end times. It says this. And we're going to go 3 through 14, but let's start 3 through 8. It says this. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? When will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This is a question that's been asked forever, right? It's not just a recent question. It's been asked, the disciples are there, Jesus, come on, man, just tell us. Can we have the inside track a little bit, right? He says this, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. That's a big thing. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you are not troubled. Amen? For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, and all of these are the beginning of sorrows. Go to the next slide. All of these are the beginning of sorrows, and then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. 
and there will be many, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end, he who endures to the end, this is a good one, he who endures to the end, amen, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Jesus gives us clearly what are some signs. And I don't know about you, but it seems like just recently in our world history, some of the signs are becoming more and more prevalent. Verse 10, and then many will be offended. How many know anybody that's offended? Anybody offended? Know somebody who's offended? I know a lot of people who are offended right now. Not by what I'm saying, but I'm saying just in general, offended. And because, verse 12, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. It seems the signs are becoming more and more prevalent. But you say, Pastor David, what does that mean? Does that mean the end is coming soon? Does that mean the end is near? Yes. And no. Does that mean the end is coming soon? I, I once heard a pastor say it this way. I love this. This is great. We are closer today than we have ever been to the end times. How many ever heard somebody say that, right? How many ever? That's how time works, dum dum. Right? Listen, tomorrow we will be closer than we are today to the end times. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make light of it, but because yes, it's true, but that's just how time is linear. That's how it goes. So when people try to use that, well, it's the end of times. We're closer now than we've ever been before. Of course we are. That's what people do. Listen, next week we're going to be closer than we are today. Right? Don't get worried. It's just how it works. It's just common sense. But so many pastors and teachers try to use this type of statement in a way of manipulating people. It's fear-mongering. And it's fear-mongering sometimes at its worst. Listen, it's true that we can know the signs, right? How many know we, we can see signs? We know the signs. It's true that we can see some evidences of what is bringing us closer to the end. But in case you aren't aware of this, there is nobody on earth who knows when Christ is going to return. Nobody on earth. If they tell you an exact date, a specific time, they are lying to you. Got it? Amen. Listen, you want to know something even more incredible than that? More incredible than us not knowing. When Jesus was here on his, in his earthly ministry, he didn't know. When Jesus was here in his earthly ministry, he didn't know. You say, Pastor David, how can that be? If you remember our short series on the Trinity, we talked about the different roles of the Trinity, and then we talked about the different functions of the roles. So God the Father was the sender, amen? God the Son is the accomplisher. We're going to focus just on those two. Of course, the Holy Spirit is uh, the one who uh, convicts, convinces. Oh, that's part of his role, right? Mark 13, 32, Jesus' words say this. But about that day, he's referring to the end of days. This is also part of the Olivet Discourse, the Mount of Olives Discourse, just in a different area. It says this, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. What does that mean, Pastor David? It means this, to understand that Jesus on his earthly ministry, part of his function was to not know when he was going to return. That's just part of his function. It didn't take away from his divinity. didn't take away from him being God. 
And as, as far as we're told, theologians say it was only during his earthly ministry that as soon as he ascended and was back in, you know, back with the big two and now he's the big three, that all that knowledge, omniscience is all still there. So now he would know. But in his earthly ministry, he didn't know. And to understand that nobody knows when Christ returns is foundational. Say foundational. Another aspect of understanding the book of Revelation is understanding our approach to it. How do we view the book of Revelation? How many have a, a, how many have a Bible with you? You got a Bible with you? I have a Bible on my iPad. You got a Bible with you? you got, yeah, you got a Bible with you, right, Caleb? Can I see it? Oh, perfect. Caleb, you didn't bring this, did you? That's all right. We left it here for you. It's good. How many know where the book of Revelation is? It's the way in the back. It's the last book of the Bible. It's the very last book of the Bible. If you study it, I want to encourage you, as we're going through this study, not just to study it on Sunday mornings with me, but to look at it yourself. Go home and look at it yourself. You say, Pastor David, some of this imagery I just I don't quite understand. We'll get there. It's interesting stuff. We're going to figure it out together. You can keep this here. But I'm sure you have one at home your parents give you, right? When we talk about the view of Revelation, the way some people look at Revelation, the way that some people read Revelation, um, we have to take a step back and look at the history of the views of Revelation. So David Guzik, who's a great commentator, tells us there's four views. He's not the only one that tells us. There's multiple ones that tell us. But there's four main views, say main views. These main views have been traditionally held by people within the Christian church, and they are this. We have preterism, say preterism. There's some interesting words here. Historicism, say historicism. Idealism, say idealism. And futurism. Yes, futurism. What is the preterist? The preterist believes this. Revelation dealt only with the church in John's day. In the preterist approach, Revelation doesn't predict anything. John simply described events of his current day. All of Revelation was fulfilled before 400 AD. Okay, so that's the preterist approach. So he puts them into a symbolic code so John put these, put these things into symbolic code so that the government couldn't understand what they were saying to each other. That's the preterist approach. There are some who are full preterists and some who are partial preterists. Okay? If you've ever heard of a guy named R.C. Sproul or Hank Hanegraaff, also known as the Bible Answer Man, um, they would be considered partial preterists. Okay? Not full, but partial. And then we get into historicism. Historicism says this, that from the uh, Jesus ascending until now, events in history are unfolding along with Revelation. So the different things that are happening in Revelation, the different images we see in Revelation, the Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast, all these types of things are happening throughout history. So they look at Nero, they looked at the Huns, they looked at all of history and they go, okay, what does this have to do? What place does it have in Revelation? Now, the problem with this is there's a lot of guesswork. There's a lot of guesswork. In fact, this is interesting. I just found this out this last week. Um, I want to say it was Tuesday night. It might have been Monday night. I had a buddy of mine contact me from college. I hadn't talked to the guy in 18 years, 17, 18 years. Uh, good guy. He lives in Canada. And so we set up a Zoom meeting at 9 o'clock at night, and we ended up talking until like 1 in the morning. Just catching up, talking about ministry, talking about where God was, where God had us, and what we were doing, and just it was really cool to connect with him again. And we start, we were talking about um, he's more of the reform tradition. We were talking about preterism and R.C. Sproul, and we got into historicism. And we <laughs> these are the conversations I have with friends. So <laughs> this is like, uh, yeah, fun stuff. But it was interesting because he said this. How many know when JFK was shot? How many? You were alive during that time. Uh, remember when JFK was shot? When President Kennedy was shot, uh, his father, my friend, his, his dad was the 
uh, pastor of a four-square church in Canada. And he was saying that at that time, when President Kennedy was shot, there was an entire belief that he was going to raise from the dead three days later, that he was the Antichrist. And so all of these people were waiting, holding their breath, waiting and watching because something about him being shot in the head and the Roman Catholic Church, the Antichrist, and all the different stuff that goes along with the imagery of historicism. So it's really interesting that they're all holding their breath. And I don't know, after three days, they all went, oh, okay. Like, I don't know. But it was really interesting that he was like, oh, yeah, this is part of historicism is the imagery tends to fall in line with different events in history. And again, not, there's not very many people who are historicists anymore. Um, there's still some, but not too many. Um, in the, back in the day, some of the, some of the historicists include this. They included John Wycliffe, William Tyndale. These are some big names in faith. Uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Charles Finney, C.H. Spurgeon, and Matthew Henry. They're all historicists. And here's what they believe. This, this is interesting, that Revelation is full of symbols that just describes events. Uh, third view is idealism. Idealism says that all of Revelation is of no historic value at all. It's however you interpret it. It is poetry. It's, it's, uh, the view of it is it's all up to you. In fact, they believe that it's a cosmic struggle between good and evil, and that that's the picture that it shows, but that there's really, uh, it's all about your own personal meaning. The last one, futurism. Futurism beginning with chapter 4, Revelation deals with the end times. The period directly preceding Jesus' return. So in the futurist view, Revelation is a book that mainly describes the end times. First four chapters, not so much, but everything from that on is visions concerning the end times. People that hold this uh, view would be Dallas Theological Seminary, Moody, a guy named Tim LaHaye, if you know who that is, John, John Walford uh, was a big name in this movement. Now in our study the next few months, I want to say this. And I say the next few months because it's going to take some time. I'm not going to draw it out just for the sake of drawing it out, but I want to make sure we get a complete grasp on what it is. And it's this. We hold and look at the view of the futurist. We believe that it is a prediction, that it is a uh, foretelling of what is going to happen leading to the return of Christ that has not happened yet. Okay? Now, there's going to be some questions that come up. Some people are going to say, well, uh, we're going to talk about pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. We're going to talk about amillennialism, post-millennialism. We're going to get all these different terms, and it can be confusing. All of them fall within futurism, okay? So remember I said this is just foundational. This is the groundwork. So we're not even going to be getting into preterism. We might examine it a little bit just to kind of debunk it a bit. Uh, historicism is really no big deal. Um, idealism, again, one we're probably going to look into because we don't see a whole lot of value in it. Futurism is mostly where we're going to stand and look at Revelation. It's the view that we hold as a body of believers. It's the view that I believe is the best way to study and interpret the book of Revelation, right? So in reading various commentaries um, on these views, it's important to understand this. Despite our various views, there are some common threads within all of these different views on Revelation. Go to the next slide. There are some common threads. The first one is this. All views believe that God is sovereign and in charge of all that occurs in history and its ultimate conclusion. So preterism, historicism, idealism, futurism, all believe, for the most part, not not. There are some who are full preterists who don't believe in the return of Christ, but we'll get into that too. Um, all views believe that God is sovereign. He's in charge of all that occurs. Go to the next slide. Most believe in the physical second coming of Christ. I say most because those who are full preterists would say no, but those who are partial, R.C. Sproul, Hank Hanegraaff would say yes. Go to the next one. 
All views believe in the resurrection from the dead. Amen? Amen. Next one. Fourth. All believe there will be a future judgment. Go next one. All believe in an eternal state in which believers will be with God and unbelievers will be separated from him. Within the Christian faith, there's a lot of talk about heaven and very little talk about hell. At some point, you got to talk about heaven and you also got to talk about hell. It's not great. It's not sunshine and rainbows, but it's reality. And it's worth getting into. The next, next one says this. All agree on the importance of the study of prophecy and its edification for the body of Christ. Because that's what this is. Jenny, will you, you and the music team come on up? This is a study for the edification of the body. Amen? It's a study. It's the importance of prophecy. Edification for the body of Christ. Will you stand with me this morning?